Last time on Communist Histories, I talked about the Anyuan Miner Strike, the most successful of the CCP's early proletarian organizing campaigns. In this video, I'll be moving back up north to Mao Zedong's headquarters in Changsha to discuss a movement that was essentially orthodox communism in its means and aims, but which was radically heterodox in its rhetoric. The time the Communist Party fought for free trade. As I mentioned in the last video, Mao originally determined that Changsha didn't have a substantial proletariat to act as a base for unionizing. But that doesn't mean it didn't have any organized labor. Construction work in Changsha was monopolized by the Luban Temple Construction Workers Guild. Guilds are not a capitalist system themselves. They arise as part of the transition between feudalism and capitalism. I'm planning a whole episode on China's class character at the time, and the use of the term feudal. So suffice to say for now that guild production is not characterized by an antagonistic relationship between capitalist and a proletariat, but by cooperation between guild masters, journeymen, and apprentices to reduce competition and prevent outsiders moving into their industry. And I want to make it clear that I'm specifically talking about guilds in China here. I do not know enough about European guild system to analyze their similarities and differences. Strict limits were placed on the number of apprentices in the guild at a time, to keep supply in check. And guilds held their members to very high standards in training and production, because one member cutting costs would hurt the guild as a whole. Guilds were strictly hierarchical, but it was seen as the hierarchy of a family. Guild masters were teachers to their apprentices, not employers. Everybody did work. To reinforce the family dynamic, guilds in China often presented themselves as having a shared ancestry. The Changsha construction workers thought of themselves as the descendants of Lu Ban, the mythical founder of construction. Guild masters sat on the board of annual directors, which made all decisions for the industry. Only they were allowed to open new firms, hire journeymen, and take apprentices, who would be taken as children and essentially adopted. Apprentices felt indebted to their masters, journeymen relied upon the masters for work, and the masters had to keep their journeymen happy, since such strict limits upon the number of apprentices in the city meant that a master would have a very time replacing anybody who left. By the 1920s, China's craft guild system was struggling. Economically, it was being overtaken by the coastal merchant guilds, which were themselves transforming into capitalist enterprises. Politically, they were under attack from reformers, who saw them as a barrier to China's industrial development. Particularly, the limit on apprentices prevented a shift to large-scale factory manufacturing. These reformers were heavily influenced by Western merchants, who felt guilds were unfair competition, so they promoted a free trade as a human right. In Changsha, this came to a head in the early 20s, when the chaos in the countryside caused by warlord armies led to a surge of peasants into the cities. The Luban Temple just couldn't resist all this labor, and in 1922, it abolished the apprentice limit but with the caveat that apprentices would still be limited by the institution of a new fee apprentices would have to pay to join. But that didn't do much to prevent new apprentices, since guild masters helpfully offered to loan their apprentices the money. These loans could only have begun to be paid off after becoming journeymen, and then it would have taken years. But before the issue with the new apprentices could develop into a crisis, the old journeymen started their own. The journeymen saw themselves as the real losers in this new arrangement. The influx of apprentices would devalue their skilled work, and once those apprentices graduated, there would be oversupply. It didn't help that over the previous decade, they had seen more and more guildmasters buying up real estate and living off rents rather than working. The workers didn't have the vocabulary to say that the guildmasters were becoming capitalists, but they noted that the guild leadership was different as the aged and respected were replaced by bad elements. The biggest issue for the journeymen was that in 1919, Hunan warlord Zhang Jingyao had declared a wage freeze for construction work. Due to inflation, this meant that by 1922, real wages had decreased by one-third. 
workers in China never made much more than, than, than subsistence wages in the first place, and this decrease was putting at the brink of starvation. When the journeyman appealed to the guild for help, the master did try to raise wages to 34 cents a day for skilled A workers, and 26 cents a day for the less skilled B workers, hoping the law might just be overlooked. But the district magistrate was lobbied by local real estate owners who needed lots of construction, and they enforced the wage freeze. The journeymen asked their masters to keep fighting for their wages, since the whole point of the guild was to work in each other's interests as a family. But the masters were reluctant, and eventually agreed only if the journeyman paid a negotiating fee of 50 cents a person. The journeyman agreed, but it did irreparable harm to the unity of the guild. Two negotiators were, were hired, who spent three months whining and dining government officials and local merchants. In the end, the district magistrate offered to keep wages the same, but switched to paying in silver. This would theoretically help against further inflation, but it did nothing to increase current wages. Needless to say, the workers didn't consider this worth the money they had spent, and they were enraged. Run Shuda was a journeyman construction worker who was working on a site that just happened to be across the street from a school Mao Zedong had established. They ran into each other and became friends, and Run became one of the first workers in Changsha to join the Communist Party. When the Lu Ban Temple announced the results of its negotiations to the journeymen, Run came to the forefront among them, pointing out that the masters were as much to blame as the government for taking their money and getting so little out of it. What kind of people do you think these masters are? They're riding high on your heads. You shouldn't even bother to blow your nose over such type who act like officials and wear long gowns and leather shoes. Run organized a protest of 800 journeymen and apprentices to demand the guild masters keep fighting for higher wages. The masters said they would be willing, but it would require another negotiation fee. That was received about as well as you'd expect, and Run suggested that the Luban Temple could no longer represent the workers, and that a new organization was needed. Three weeks later, on September 5th, Run, with assistance from Mao, convened the founding congress of the Changsha Construction Workers Union. This temple is an organization that exploits workers. We asked for an increase in our wages, and you collected over 3,000 silver yuan from us and gave us nothing. The union is the workers' own organization. We will rely on our own power, and we will win benefits for the workers. If anyone tries to tear down our union, he had better be careful, or he will be sorry. The union began propagandizing. It established a night school and passed out leaflets and posters. Members would hide out near military barracks and wait for the officer to go to sleep, then they fired an arrow with leaflets tied to it through the window. Once, a group broke into a wealthy contractor's house while he was eating dinner, and they began analyzing the food he was eating compared to their own. All things we definitely need to bring back. Mao still had press contacts in Hunan from his days working in the liberal, Hunanese self-government government movement. They all published articles supporting the construction workers. To appeal to the reformers in the city, these articles generally focused not on the poor treatment of the, of the guild's workers, but on the fact that the wage freeze was unreasonable government interference and an affront to free enterprise. Eventually, the district magistrate offered a 6% wage increase, not nearly enough. And on October 5th, the union leadership met at Mao's house to announce it was going on strike in the name of free enterprise. Eleven days into the strike, the government hadn't acknowledged it at all. The magistrate and guildmasters clearly thought it would, just go, just, it would just go away on its own. So the union threatened to march on the magistrate's house with a petition in two days. The magistrate offered to go back into negotiations and threatened, if you refuse to listen, you'll be, you'll be bringing bitterness down upon yourselves. Everyone think long and hard, and do not, do not wait until it's too late, and you regret it. The guild masters weren't opposed to wage increase in principle, but they were adamantly opposed to the union usurping their control. They had agents infiltrate the union to discredit Ren Shu De, and began publicly supporting the magistrate's decisions. And then, the magistrate enacted his master plan. He offered to raise all workers' wages to 30 cents per day. Compared to the union's demand of 34 cents for A workers and 26 cents for B workers, this would have actually cost employers more money, and it was a decent raise for everybody. But the union had staked its reputation on the 34 cent number, and it was clearly a tactic devised to rupture the unity of the workers. Luckily for the union, the B workers credited it with getting them any raise in the first place, and enough showed the support for Run to turn down the offer. On October 23rd, 4,000 workers marched in the district office 
bearing a sign reading, 34 cents a day or we won't leave the district office. Upon reaching the office, they found the gates blocked by a table. On top of the table were two benches. And on top of the benches were two signs. One declaring martial law and threatening that marchers would be shot on sight. The other reading, the daily wage of all construction workers shall be 30 cents. Run Shuda and 15 other, other union representatives were allowed in to speak to the magistrate. Run tried appealing to the magistrate's conscience, saying, if we don't receive the small raise, we won't be able to live. But the magistrate pointed out that 30 cents was ample to live on, so they shouldn't complain. And it was hard to argue with that, because 30 cents was a good offer. It was just a good offer designed to destroy the union. Negotiations went nowhere, and representatives continued occupy occupying the office as the marchers settled in to continue blockading the gates overnight, while workers from other, other industries in Changsha came out to bring them food and supplies. But the local warlord, now Zhao Hongdi, who had tried to keep himself out of the spotlight up until now, was not willing to let a massive crowd occupy the streets all night. He sent a representative to tell the Union that if it dispersed and its leaders met with him the next day, he would guarantee the strike would get settled in their favor. At 3 a.m., the Union finally decided to meet with him, and everyone went home. The next day, the 16 representatives went to the governor's office, bringing Mao Zedong, who had remained in the crowd the previous night, with them to help negotiate. At the governor's office, they were kept waiting in the reception room for hours, and had to threaten to have the, the workers march back to actually get an audience. Not with Zhao, but his negotiator, Wu, as well as some leading guildmasters. Wu argued with Ren that the government's hands were tied. The frozen wages weren't the problem, it was the rising costs. And those weren't the government's fault. Mao suggested that if the government had the right to control wages, it should also have the right to control prices. And when Wu changed the topic to the dis disruption caused by the Union, Mao pointed out their, their constitutional right to petition the government. At this point, Wu became suspicious that Mao wasn't actually a worker, and asked his name. In response, Mao went on a long rant about Adam Smith, how free trade guaranteed workers the right to strike and organize. He pointed out that the wage freeze violated free enterprise, which was protected by the Constitution. It was protect protected by the Constitution. But people had usually taken that to mean, let capitalists start businesses. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to pre protect working people. The guildmasters interjected that such free enterprise would mean the end of the guild, since anyone could just come in and sell goods and services. Which was, of course, what the union was getting at, that the guild was obsolete, and the union rep represented the workers. Mao suggested that if Wu really wanted to know what the workers wanted, he should send somebody to the worker school and ask them. He did, and it was reported back that there were thousands of angry workers demanding free enterprise and threatening to occupy the governor's office. The union leaders had been kept waiting so long that the workers were worried they'd been executed. Delaying, Wu told the representatives to go back and write up a specific proposal and come back tomorrow. They did, and returned the next day with a petition at the end of March of 20,000 workers from various industries. It stuck to the original 34 cent raise, as well as legalizing union activities. When they brought it to Wu, the guildmasters tried to insert a clause giving them a say in all future wage negotiations. But the union stood firm. And when the crowd outside grew restless, Wu backed down and signed the union's version. As Ren announced the success to the crowd, cries went out of workers of the world unite, long live labor, and long live free enterprise. Union organizing would continue to be a key aspect of communist organizing in China. And I want to make that very clear. At no point while Mao was alive did the Communist Party of China ever abandon or stop working with the urban proletariat. But in 1923, the party made a major strategic shift that would shift traditional labor organizing into a place of secondary importance until the 1950s. And we'll be seeing the beginning of that road next week, with the founding of the First United Front. Like and subscribe so you don't miss it. Thanks for watching.